Awesome to welcome UC Irvine head coach, Russell Turner. Russell Turner is the winningest coach in UC Irvine history, has guided the Anteaters to 227 wins, averaging over 20 wins a season. Coach Turner, who enters his 12th season as head coach at UC Irvine in 2021-22, has led the Eaters to six postseason appearances, including the 2015 and 2019 NCAA tournament. Coach Turner, welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks, Chris. It's uh, great to be with you, and I really appreciate all the things you're doing for so many of us who benefit from your work. Well, thank you. And uh, it's exciting to be able to talk to you. And uh, I guess let's start with this. And, uh, you know, obviously coming out of a pandemic, different things like that. To put coaching in perspective, we can just point to your wife and uh, sacrifices she's made on behalf of humanity. Oh, yeah. Well, um, thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, my wife is a critical care doc. So she's been working in the intensive care unit with COVID patients for the last 18 months, which does keep what we do in perspective. And um, we're hoping to be, you know, moving into a more normal season, which I think we will be. But uh, I'm appreciative of so many people who made sacrifices for us to play last year and uh, for the continued sacrifices that so many are making now to give us a chance to play again. Well, we're going to talk about a lot of things that you guys do, which may be a little bit different or unique and uh, certainly are working tremendously for you guys at UC Irvine. Uh, Maybe start with this and that's staff continuity. And that's kind of rare at a level like you're coaching at to have such staff continuity, isn't it? It is rare. And, um, and I don't take it for granted. You know, we've had outstanding assistant coaches here um, and, and those guys own the success that we've had as a program as much as anyone. Um, The guys I've got with me now, Ryan Battertelli has been with me the whole way here and was actually on staff when I got hired. Um, It was a really great thing that that I kept him um, and that he's uh, grown into the type of coach he is. I know he's going to be a head coach one day. I hope that opportunity comes for him soon. Uh, But he is, he's made a, made a difference here for us from the beginning. And then I've got two former players on my staff now too, as coaches. You know, one is Mike Wilder, who was a six foot one power forward who made all conference um, out of nowhere. And uh, the others are are all time winning as point guard here, Alex Young. So those two guys have been terrific. And I want to quickly shout out uh, Blaine Taylor and Ali Tong and Nick Booker, um, all who were assistant coaches for me um, and, and, and for our program here who were really great contributors. Uh, great, great success at this program. And uh, I think sometimes people are a little unsure. Sometimes when we talk about all the different UCs, sometimes people get them confused. (laughs) So we'll we'll make sure people know the style and how you guys play and why you've led to success. But, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the coaches that have influenced you, but uh, I thought it was pretty cool when some of your assistants pointed out or reminded you, because I'm sure you know, that uh, you've coached two uh, NBA MVPs with as Tim Duncan and Steph Curry, Steph Curry in the NBA and then Tim Duncan at uh, Wake Forest. Yeah. Yeah. That's a distinction that, uh, that, that earns us some credibility from time to time. You know, that's just been great fortune for me to be around those guys. Um, Two of the all time greats, I think, you know, in the game and, um, and my path has been lucky enough to cross with those guys. And so I've gotten to see some of, how they became what they became. And what I'd like to share with my players mostly and with the guys that we recruit is that those two guys are, are guys who are some of the best teammates I've ever seen, uh, have some of the best character and best brains for the game. And most critically, they just kept getting better. You know, neither one of those guys was near the player uh, when they were 18 years old, when, when guys usually get to us that they became neither one of those guys were highly regarded at that age, but they kept getting better. And so uh, that's one of the fun things about the recruiting that we get to do is try to find guys who um, can have the maturity to see down the line a little bit and to remain committed and to find out how good they can be. We've had a lot of that here. And I'm really, I'm really fortunate that we've had guys to buy into some of that mindset and to keep getting better and better. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about recruiting and how that connects to what you do on offense and defense and the the university as well. Maybe just before we get there, why don't you give coaches a feel for the overall defensive philosophy, uh, just in terms of how you are running your defense at UC Irvine? Okay, yeah, uh, great. Um, And this is something that we, we, we came about in part 
um, because of our recruiting strategy, I think. And, and so I'll connect those in a minute, but we, we're one of the best um, field goal percentage defense teams, which means we have an outstanding defensive efficiency because we protect the rim at a level that's really surprising, I think, for you know, mid-major or, um, or whatever people label us as. Um, we do a really good job of, of making sure that teams against us don't get easy points, um, you know, easy shots at the rim especially. Um, it's critical for us to play without fouling. Um, and we don't create many turnovers, but we do force teams to take uncomfortable shots. Um, and, and that's, you know, uh, that's something that uh, we've bought into. And, and I think we've uh, gradually made it better and better here so that we hope we can maintain some consistency there. And what will lead to that consistency is if we can continue to recruit high-level defensive players, disruptors, shot blockers, difference makers. Uh, I think that's, that's what has defined our program. Well, it has. And, uh, you know, again, we'll get into the recruiting process, talking about that you're, you're recruiting really two traditional bigs, if you can, that can protect the rim and play around the rim. And that's part of the defensive philosophy. Uh, before we get there, then, how is the uh, your your does, I guess the influence of the inside and trying to take away the inside advantage? How does that influence what you do on the outside in terms of stance, where you're forcing the ball, different things like that, relative to uh, help off the ball as well, maybe? Okay, yeah. So we we um, the way I explain it to our team or to the newcomers that come into our team, we're always going to flow to the ball and protect the rim with our with our centers. Mm-hmm. And we'll use our centers and our centers have had great size. And so that's fit together with, you know, strategically for us and the fours, the power forwards always protect the centers first. And so basically our fours and fives are always charged with protecting the rim. Uh, The five protects the rim, the four protects the five, and then everybody else protects those two. And so our whole philosophy sort of works off of that. We're not a pack line team, Uh, pack line teams, you know, sort of all guard the ball. Um, We make it look sometimes like we're a pack line team, but we really stress making um, the scoring area crowded and then pushing away the shooters. And so we try to take three-point shots away, especially from the team's best three-point shooters. And we really put a high emphasis on contesting threes. And and I think one of the things that uh, I know makes me a little bit different than most coaches is that I don't mind three-point shooting fouls. I mean, I don't like them. Nobody wants to give up three free throws. But I do um, want our guys to have an incredibly aggressive mindset to contest threes. And I think that when we do that well, that's when our defense performs at its highest level. Um, and, and I learned that type of, uh, you know, um, willingness to go against the grain a little bit from, from a man, Don Nelson, who I know we're going to talk about soon. You know, he um, so much in our game depends on how games are being called. And I think in the college game, especially, there's a lot of three-point shooting fouls that get overlooked by referees. So we're going to be aggressive and make sure we're we're taking full advantage of everything that's being allowed in a given game. Well, a lot of this podcast is going to be a little bit divergent, and I think that's why it's going to be a lot of fun for coaches to listen to this as well. And even that's what I love about your stuff. (laughs) Yes, I hope I could give you. Yeah, it kind of goes with my mo too. I know. Um, So part of this then is uh, don't help one pass away funnel to the rim or flow to the rim, as you say, and we're more likely to help at the rim and then cover down and then try and recover shooters from there. Is that what I understand? Yeah. In general, it's uh, it's obviously not that simple. You know, the, the key is. when um, some of the keys, I guess, you know, with, uh, with perimeter players, we like to, um, we really stress tendency. And so um and, and I learned from the guy at Carlton um, with the force left defense, you know, I was a um, personnel tendency um, scout for a period of time in the NBA. So I learned to look at the game that way. And that's really helped me. And so we do a lot of our preparation now toward that. And so we combine rim protection with um, force and tendency on the other team's most creative or best players. And so we are often asking our defenders to make sure that uh, the creative playmakers for the other team are going to a place where they're not as comfortable. And by doing that, I think we gain, we, we gain some critical advantages and, uh, and we were able to exploit those. And um, it makes us hard to play against because I think that uh, teams aren't used to what we do. 
and, and it's not always easy to, you know, to make the critical adjustments. Most teams are trying to get their best players in position to play to their strengths. Well, our, our whole preparation emphasis has taken that away or making that more difficult. So in terms of scout, you're focused more on player tendencies than opponent plays. You're focused more on the individual and understanding the individual. Yeah, yeah, I, I'd say far more. I mean, it's not even really close. And that's the opposite of the way I was trained as a college basketball coach, you know, back, back you know, in Division Three at Hampton City, then also for a great defensive coach, um, in Dave Odom at Wake Forest, and then and then Mike Montgomery also looked at the game very differently. I think many coaches look at set plays, and I think it's far more critical um, when you're preparing for the end of the game, especially. And that's what I learned in the NBA. It, it, everything in the NBA that happens, you know, in the first 44 minutes matters less than what happens in the last four. And I uh, brought that mentality to college, and so that's how we prepare. You know, I don't ask my assistant coaches to give me drawings. Um, we know the set plays, especially, you know, the ones that teams use for easy baskets. We work really hard to take the easy basket plays away. And then we work really hard um, to understand where the game's likely to be decided late and to make sure that our defense is locked into doing the things that, that we think will make us successful in those late possessions. Well, and you actually have a phrase for that, too. You call them butter possessions. Can you explain that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I can't express how much I learned working alongside Don Nelson in the NBA. And he brought a confidence um, and a communication style that, that I had never imagined um, to the sideline, to the locker room, to practices. And one of the things he did that gave us confidence, gave me confidence as a newcomer to the NBA is the last eight seconds of the shot clock, he called butter. And, you know, when we're in that situation and the shot clock's winding down, we're not counting down, you know, eight, seven, six. We just call out butter and keep calling it out. And then we work on um, the things that we want to emphasize most then on both offense and defense. And, you know, we uh, don't attempt to try to play a really fast paced game here. I'm willing to do that, especially if it suits our talent. Um, but in the most critical games for us, the most pressure packed games, what we think is that. Um, a lot of times games are decided by butter possessions. So possessions in the last eight seconds of the clock, whether on offense or defense, we work on that a lot. And we work on communicating it. We work on executing it. It's great. So give us a feel maybe for how you artificially create that scenario in practice, because that is obviously one of the challenges to create that similar type of time pressure. And then that understanding of how to execute on offense and defense under eight seconds. Okay. Yeah, good. So for, um, to, to work on that in practice, you know, we'll just put eight on the shot clock and then and repeat eight on the shot clock or less. And, and, you know, sometimes I'll say, you know, for a rebounding game, I'll say, give me a three second butter. And so we'll, you know, we'll close out to the ball with three on the clock or with five on the clock or with eight on the clock. So we get a feel for, um, for that time pressure. Most college players don't have the feel for that time pressure that pro players have. Pro players know that eight seconds is an eternity. Um, sometimes I joke with my young guys, hey man, you don't have to shoot it when I say butter. I say butter to let you know we got plenty of time to shoot. Yeah. Um, but we work on that on defense because the, you know, the critical thing in butter on defense is to not foul, not, you know, not get lifted by shot fakes, um, not do something stupid or unnecessary in that time, but to you know, really lock into your fundamentals. Um, so we just adjust the time um, periodically with drills that we do, whether they're rebounding drills or closeout drills or whatever, we adjust the time on the shot clock. And then we're really good at communicating butter. And so anytime we're playing and the ball and shot clock gets inside of eight, the expectation is that everybody on the floor is reminding his teammates about butter. Um, and then in the games, we do a good job of that. And, if you watch us play, you can probably hear me or anybody else on our sideline using that terminology over and over again. And we've got a bunch of um, key words like that, I think, that are that are real different than a lot of college teams uh, that help us in some in small ways and some in significant ways like butter. Well, I, I want to highlight to coaches that uh, this is actually a focus cue. Like more than anything, you are telling your players that when you say butter, hey, listen, dig in. You're almost playing offense again. And get the stop because you've made it this far. And that's, right, right. you know, a natural human tendency is like, 
oh, we're still playing defense, and then concentration drops in the last eight. So it's yeah, well, then on the offensive that, side, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and on the offensive side, it's the same. You know, it's a reminder that the defense is likely to be jumpy and make foolish mistakes if we'll remain patient and use all that time. Yeah, like um, don't bail out a bad shot that somebody's rushing because right, right. Clock, and, right. And you know, I asked Nelly why, why did he call it butter. And I don't even remember what he said, but he said that the whole key to that was just a word that you didn't otherwise hear. Mm -hmm. And so it was a word that was, you know, easy to be part of our language. And, and I've taken um, that thought process and added other words like that, that you wouldn't hear otherwise, um, that, that, are, that are quick cues that our players can identify. Well, I'd love to hear more of those, but maybe before we do, just give us a feel. What's, what is your preference under eight seconds in terms of your defense first? Uh, because I know you're not, traditionally a switcher on your defensive side and a lot of teams right. would switch under eight. Yeah, we don't switch. Um, and, and it's not like we don't ever switch, but our game plan is to not switch our game. Uh, a lot of our defensive success comes from um, assigning and utilizing our best individual defenders against the guys who are most impactful on the other team's offense. Um, and so if we have that late in the clock, we usually like it. You know, and, and all, that also connects to the fact that we recruit defensive players. Um, we will, um, you know, so typically at Butter, what we're trying to do is force the guy who has the ball to be uncomfortable. You know, if, we're, if it's a shooter who has the ball, you know, a deep shooter, we're going to climb all the way up into him and force him to as we can, and we know where the help's coming from, and we're going to stay down on shot fake and make him miss. Um, if it's a post player, we – you know, we know that uh, we're going to take away his best move and we, we have specific things that we're asking our post defenders to do and to, to try to make the offensive team do. When it comes to the switching, you asked about, you know, we really work on beating picks and, and that's a mentality. We, we work on beating picks and we just work at it and we get better at it. And, you know, we, we, we see our team get punished by it when we don't do it. Uh, so we get guys who are committed to beating picks and good at beating picks um, and then we, I think, do a good job of crowding and protecting. And, you know, we, we do um, peel switching is something I've, I've learned about as a terminology thing. You know, we've late switched always. You know, like if a, if a guy, you know, does come off of the screen free and our center especially is, a, is forced to help at the rim, you know, we do a good job of um, veering off of, one man into another in those emergency situations. You know, Nelly taught me that. He called it late switching. Uh, now people are calling it peel switching, whatever. But um, we do switch in those situations. But in general, we can avoid switching um, if we if we well execute the strategies that we've put in play. Yeah, very cool. And uh, knowing your your philosophy defensively in terms of taking away an offensive player's advantage. How much does that influence what you do in the last eight seconds in offense on butter situations? Yeah, it's all of it. Um, almost, you know, we don't, I don't look at the game as uh, coming down to, you know, the, the, the actions you're going to use late. I look at, I look at the game like Nelly taught me to, and that's how do you find the best matchups? Um, how do you find the best matchups to, to put an immediate problem on the defense? And then how do you react to, being able to create that. Um, and then there's some games for us, you know, where we're going to be um, undermanned. And then that's really hard. Um, those are the hardest games for us to play well and win. Um, but what it allows us to do is really focus on where we're going to go, uh, what type of shot we're going to try to, um, you know, create or initiate, try to get the next thing. And then it uh, makes our guys pretty well connected to the importance of not turning the ball over, you know, if we can get a, some kind of decent shot um, from, you know, a place on the floor or a guy on our team that we want to take it from, if we can also cover the boards really well, if that shot comes off, then we're likely to be a really efficient offensive team if I've got veteran players. And so we've been that and we've had veteran players. We have young players. It's harder to, it's harder to have the discipline to do those things. So in your recruiting, and you've talked about this as well as the importance of connecting your team's style, your identity uh, to, to the university in your recruiting, but you've also made this decision to try and uncover undervalued defensive players in recruiting. 
and you've had great success with that. Can you talk about all those things and how they come together in terms of the type of player you look at recruiting? Yeah, well, the the recruiting undervalued guys is out of necessity. You know, there's not um, there's not a lot of guys who wake up every day when they're young dreaming of coming to UC Irvine, um, and and you know we know that, and and that was especially true when we got here and we were not perceived to be very good. Um, and I'm not trying to sell, sell this place short. I think you can do as well from here as from anywhere in the country. And then we find guys who, who want that opportunity. But I often believe that, um, you know, much like we all read about in Moneyball and baseball, there are still things that are undervalued in basketball. I think uh, shot blocking is undervalued in basketball uh, because often the best shot blockers are poor offensive players. And I point to Bill Russell's example, you know, Bill Russell's left-handed shot blocker. He wasn't that good of an offensive player, but he sure made his team win. So we're trying to find uh, impactful defensive operators. And sometimes those guys are rim protectors. Sometimes those guys are um, guys who can really, um, you know, take a a best player out of his comfort zone, um, you know, as a perimeter defender. Uh, If we can find those type of guys, um, that are, we can sometimes get higher level players than we would get if we were focused on the offensive side of the ball. And, and I think we've done that. I think that my staff has done a great job of knowing that um, we might gain an advantage if, if we looked at the game that way. And then I've backed it up by playing those guys. You know, I, I play some guys who look offensively limited, um, but if they're as committed on the defensive end as I want our team to be, um, I think that there's team growth that can occur because of reward um, those defensive instincts or efforts. And so that's sort of fit together that way for us. And it's, it's, it's been a solid formula, um, but we lost two of our top defenders from last season's team. And some of what that may mean for us is we're a little bit more um, offensive oriented in this year's version of our program. Well, it's great. And in some cases, you've played, I believe, most recently, the tallest lineup in college basketball history. So you're definitely (laughs) playing them. (laughs) And that's important. And uh, obviously, this has a lot of impact on different things that you do. Um, But one of them, like you've talked about the commitment to also not just playing big, but playing deep. Can you talk about how that fits into your philosophy of playing a deeper rotation? Yeah, yeah. And and I do think that's been critical here for UC Irvine. And I didn't really touch that much on um, how we try to connect our recruiting to this community. But that is, you know, that's as critical as anything we do. And I was fortunate to be at Stanford and at Wake Forest before two great academic institutions where, where some versions of the conventional wisdom were that it was hard to win because you couldn't get, um, the, you know, maybe certain types of players. Uh, Montgomery turned that on its ear at Stanford. Well, we were, we were really good because we were so smart and committed and tough. Um, and, and, and I'm sorry, Chris, what was the question you just asked me? I didn't want to get too off track, but I sort of distracted myself. <laughs> That's all right. Sorry about that. Part of this fun. Uh, we go down the rabbit holes. So we were talking about also that you play deep. So oh, deep. you had okay. mentioned, that, yeah, the importance of playing players, but you actually play. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we do. And um, that's also a real conscious decision that we've come to um, once we've gotten our program better established bunch of reasons for that you know the, the the top prize we can win is the big west tournament you know and to win that big west tournament ever since i've been here it's it's been required that you have to win three games in three days and so i think that we have to really work to develop depth in order to have a chance to be at our competitive best on that third day um, so we work at it and um and, and I, I do recruit deep especially um big guys we have a lot of big guys and one of the things that I tell all the ones that we recruit is that the best way to get better is to go against other good players. And in many college basketball programs, there aren't enough big guys for big guys to consistently be challenged on a daily basis by other people with size. Uh, so we've recruited a lot of big guys and we give them a lot of chances. Um, and I keep 16 on my roster, um, which is three, three more than the scholarship limit. You know, I was a division three player. And I know that there's good players at every level. And we have the opportunity at University of California, Irvine, to offer admissions slots uh, to players that might choose to go on scholarship to lower levels. And we've uncovered some really, really outstanding 
competitors and players uh, with the idea that we're going to recruit to all 16 spots. And I've had multiple guys who started in our program as non-scholarship players who went on to become all conference, all conference competitors. Um, you know, we, we've been solid with that. And I watched that happen even at Stanford. I mean, even at Stanford, we had, we had non-scholarship players who impacted our program and helped us win games. And so I think maybe uh, overall we've been more committed to that than, than many other coaches are. And I'm not saying we're right. You know, I mean, I've just read a book by Nick Nurse, and he's saying, hey, play your top eight and play them as much as you can, as often as you can. And um, everybody's got to figure out the, the strategy that best fits where they are. Well, and, and especially in this era of transfers and all the different things that college coaches are dealing with, I mean, finding a way to connect with your whole roster has got to be an important part of this. Yeah, that's going to become even more of a challenge. You know, we've, we've heavily utilized the redshirt rule. And, um, and, and I, I've been able to get a lot of guys to buy into um, how good they can become if they have another year. Uh, but that's going to get harder and harder. You know, right now I've told people that we've got 12 freshmen this year because I've got three third-year freshmen, guys that redshirted their first year in this program and then redshirted again last year because of the NSA rules. So they're, they're technically freshmen again, even though they're third-year players. Um, it's it's going to be interesting to see how that COVID rule, um, you know, what, what sort of changes it causes across college basketball in terms of programs and their continuity. So you, you mentioned uh, playing bigger at the four and five than most college teams and the goal is to protect the rim and to protect each other. So maybe let's build from there. So let's talk maybe first about transition defense. Is there anything different because you're big in terms of how you approach transition defense? Yeah. Um, number one, we work at it. We, we work at that as much as anything. I mean, um, we will run back on defense and, and, and we'll run back hard. And uh, there are a few key things that we've learned matter a lot because we often, because we're big, we often have our big guys around the rim when shots go up. And, and that's a key component to our offensive success is board coverage. Um, one of the things that our assistants began to emphasize that made us a lot better is elbow rebounds, especially in retreat from the corners. Uh, so we do a really good job when our guys are spaced. We don't run straight back. We run back through the elbows, which means we take a look at the long misses. And so we win a lot of offensive rebounds in those plays. Um, but then we, um, we do a good job, I think, of getting back our, our rules, back, um, back ball and threats. We've got to get back. We've got to stop the ball. We've got to pick up threats. And, you know, we are not able to secure matchups. Like we don't like switching, but we're not able to secure matchups in transition unless we can slow the ball. Um, so we work on that. Um, we also, <clears throat> um, you know, we, we work on kicking our big guys out. You know, we, we have to protect the rim and kick the big guys out. Um, one of the things that I, I found is that often if we're facing a transition team, a team that's really good in transition, we'll play more zone early because of how much easier it is. Um, to play transition defense in zone because the offense gets slightly confused on who's guarding them. Uh, that's something I learned from uh, our assistant coaches here that I didn't know when I got this head coaching job is that transition defense in zone is often way more effective than transition defense in man. And then we use uh, another word uh, like butter. I call you go. Um, and that was from, we needed a word for take foul. So I could bark it out. You go. And, uh, and our guys would know we wanted to take a foul. And because we're big and other teams try to play fast against us, we often will take fouls, um, especially with our bench players, to prevent um, teams from thinking they can get out and get easy buckets against us. So the Yugo, it's to disrupt transition. And also because you play deep, you have more opportunities to do Yugos without worrying about, you know, obviously fouls and giving up too many fouls, right? Yeah, yeah, and you know we 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 are very conscious of the um, bonus free throw situation too. So we don't, um, you know, we don't want to give up free throws. If, if if teams get free throws against us, then we're a weaker defensive team. Um, but I do think every coach needs a word for foul. I mean, um, we, you know, we played Louisville in the NCAA tournament, and I was dismayed because we had the ball late. Patino was screaming foul, 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 and their guy dove for the ball, and the referee didn't call it even though they were saying foul, foul, foul. I mean, it seemed obvious that the call should have been made. 
I think Hugo is more of an effective word because we all know it means foul, um, but it doesn't sound like we're doing something intentional or unsportsman. Yeah, and in calling out foul obviously confuses potentially you, but it also could potentially confuse referees into thinking you are fouling when you might be saying don't foul. So right, having, a, right, word, yeah. having <laughs> a word that you only know is so important. Right, right. Uh, yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, we have a lot of those words. And um, and and Nelly taught me the importance of those words. And, and you know, usually they're words that you wouldn't associate with basketball at all. That's great. Uh, can you give us a few other examples of some of those words? <laughs> uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, wedge is our word for two for one. And um, we're going to take that every time we can on offense. Um, let's see. I hadn't thought of those, Chris. I wasn't going to give it's out. It's okay. Uh, Coach Wedge, then, so the two-for-one scenario, is there a time that you, like, have designated, because that seems to be from NBA on down, that they know exactly when they should be doing two-for-ones and not? So do you have a specific time you give to your players? Not a specific one. Um, yeah. You know. Just generally think, whenever you can get yeah, it. Trying to get, I think trying to get too specific about it uh, reduces the, you know, the aggression advantage you get uh, from – from freeing players up to go take a, to go earn and take and make hopefully a quick shot. Um, you know, we, I, I will always do that in a close game though. Um, in a close game late, we're going to be aggressive. You know, one of the things that Nelly taught me is that um, late in games, you go faster, not slower. And that was, you know, another example of Nelly's Nelly being opposite convention, conventional wisdom for that. Cause every coach I'd seen would, would, you know, want his offense to be slower and more cautious late. And his idea was that you want to be more aggressive later, even than earlier, uh, because uh, mistakes often get made and you often can get, you know, foul calls or easy buckets if you're willing to be aggressive when the game's on the table. Uh, so we try to do that. Um, we work on those two for ones, you know, in a lot of different situations. And one of the things I'm surprised doesn't happen more is uh, we really work to get those at the end of the first half, um, you know, by using a timeout if we haven't used it, you know, so we'll, you know, we can push the ball. If you get it across half court in college, you know, you get the ball with the hash on the side. And so we're a pretty good hash sideline team um, at getting a quick shot. So we'll use those situations a lot at the end of halves. And then we'll also, look to use those at the end of games. So uh, maybe it's more phrasing than a term, but you've also mentioned uh, scoring area defense and what you emphasize yeah. within that. Can you talk about that, the importance of the scoring area defense? Yes, yes, yes. I'm glad you asked because that's uh, often something that I take for granted and, and, and don't explain to other coaches. Um, we, don't, we don't defend outside the scoring area. So, you know, obviously – the Steph Curry scoring area is 40 feet and in, um, but there aren't many guys like that. Um, and some, some big guys, especially because of how big we play, will play against other big guys whose scoring area may not be even 10 or 12 feet. And so if a guy who can't score from 15 feet has not at 15 feet, we're not going to play him. We're not going to get out and pressure him, um, but we will get into guys in their scoring areas. So the best shooters, you know, we're going to pressure them a little bit more, a little bit further away from the goal. And so scoring area impacts how we guard with pick and roll, for example, because we're not going to, um, you know, we're not going to go over picks outside the scoring area. We're just going to get under them. Um, and we're not going to, we're not going to make any sort of aggressive plays on anything outside the scoring area. And we're going to make decisions based on where the ball is on the court. And once our guys get used to that here, that's really easy for them to understand. And so we exert, a ton of effort in the scoring area and we exert a ton of effort to push guys out of the scoring area. So often our um, wings, for example, will, you know, we, we talk about push to nine. We want to push offensive players outside the scoring area so they get their catch. And then if they have to use their dribble to get in the scoring area, then it makes it easier for us to defend an action. Um, we, we make good decisions like that. And, uh, and that requires us to have smart guys who can be adaptable and figure things out. But that's another way we fit well at this university. So this push deny is a great concept, obviously, uh, based on scout, push people out of their comfort area. And you mm -hmm. talked about making uncomfortable shots, part of the philosophy. 
Uh, can you also talk about what happens on penetration then with this crowd and push away? Uh, because you talked about being different than pack line as well. Uh, okay, sure. If uh, you know, if you think of a uh, penetration from the top of the floor, if there's a corner shooter, um, the guy who guards the corner for us, you know, his job is to make it crowded and push away. So he wants, to, and I want him, I want him to do his best to make the guy who's dribbling the ball think that he's going to help, but not help, and and push away and 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 try to uh, play the ball. Um, if it's being passed as he's pushed pushing away, and that gives him a head start towards his closeout and. You know, what we say is arrive when the ball arrives. And, and I say, make them feel you. And I usually say, um, make them feel you with another word inserted in there because of how important it is to us that when, um, especially the better offensive players on another team, when they catch the ball, I want them to feel defense and have to adjust to defense. And so we're rarely inactive uh, on the ball unless a kid who's got the ball is outside of a scoring area. Uh, so I think we were really aggressive in the scoring area. I think we do a really good job, of especially being aggressive and forcing guys to their weaker side. Um, and then as a rule, we, we work a lot on um, making plays from the position of getting beat. You know, we, we don't work so much on shell defense. We do, we do shell defense, uh, but we, um, we work more on our shell from a position where we've given up penetration. And, and how do we get back? How do we finish the defense? Once we're beat, how do we finish the defense? How do we help and stop or slow the ball and get back to the next thing? Um, our guys buy into that. And uh, we get better and better at it typically as the year goes on. Of course. And, uh, you know, it strikes me that uh, defensive IQ and defensive decision making are a part of what you're teaching and what you're emphasizing. And to a certain extent, they've got to be really connected and I'm curious then, is the first communication the one that everyone follows, even if they're wrong? Or how is this communication system working um, in terms of the defense? You know, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm going to attack it two ways. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right about the decision-making. We train the decision-making, especially for our big guys. The big guys as decision-makers are critical. And so we've had the defensive player of the year in our conference a bunch of years in a row. It's always been a big guy. Um, and I think we do a really good job of teaching those big guys how to make good decisions of how much to help, how much to try to impact the ball, how to confuse the people with the ball so that we can play around that. Um, and so the communication usually comes from our bigs most. And, you know, I'm a big, big guy myself and a loud guy myself. So I put a lot of pressure on those big guys to be good communicators and for those to play off of that. Um, but we don't do that much communicating on the floor defensively, other than calling the ball and calling the first help. And, and then we, we teach the fundamentals through communication and practice, but then um, mostly I'm, I'm, I'm just requiring uh, communications around screens, you know, <laughs> and, and our big guys are mostly responsible for that. And, and they're usually the loudest guys. So uh, communicating around screens or to, to your uh, defending on screens, are we more likely to chase because you've got size on the floor and you'd rather force curl for a lot of players to be able to curl to a big and protection at the rim? Or is that part of what your philosophy would be? Yeah, that's part of our, uh, our, our tendency philosophy. You know, if a guy's a great three point shooter, we're going to chase him. Typically, if a guy's more of a driver, we're going to gap him. And because we're consistent usually with our matchups, because we don't switch, we get good at making those decisions. I always say, I always tell the guys, I'm gonna give them their head. I'm gonna give you, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna trail a screen that's set outside the scoring area. If you do that, you're behind the play. Um, but you're not gonna shoot the gap in a scoring area against a great three-point shooter. That doesn't make any sense. That's stupid. So we teach our guys how to make those decisions, um, and then and then we really work on beating screens. Like, it doesn't matter to me whether a guy chases over a screen or gaps a screen, as long as he beats it and he's there. If you're there when the ball arrives, I'm good. And you know you're gonna, you know your big guy's going to have your back at the rim, um, but you better beat that screen. If you're late getting through that screen, you die a little bit on that screen, I'm going to find another guy who won't. That's great. And, uh, you know, a big part of this we've talked about, it's, it's scouting report, base, base defense in the sense that players have to know 
offensive tendencies and force them to weakness and different things love developed to that. But it's also solution based. And you playing this defense, you know what can hurt you. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll give you one example that you shared with me, and that's if you're playing against the, a lot of bigs that are shooters, pick and pop shooters are a problem, then you know that you can go to your 2-3 zone as the counter to that. Uh, can you talk yeah, about yeah. some of the other things that you can do to counter uh, what you might be giving up? And I think particularly we might be thinking, say, ball screen coverage, uh, because you said don't cover in scoring areas, but if the scoring area changes, what are players doing, adapting, et cetera? Okay, well, let me start with the um, the shooting bigs because that's the question I always get with um, when, when I talk about our rim protection emphasis. And so with the shooting bigs, um, often I think coaches make the mistake where they play their center against the other tallest guy. Um, we almost always play our center against the least three-point shooting guy, you know, whatever position that guy may be um, in a given matchup. That's, that's how we look at it. And I'm also – really attentive um, to, to other matchups that way. We'll often use small defenders uh, to get up under, um, you know, longer offensive players to make them uncomfortable. I'm not at all afraid of giving up post-up um, height disadvantage because we always have somebody protecting the rim behind them. Um, so that's, uh, that, that's, that's one thing. Um, and then, I'm sorry, the other part of the question you asked again? Well, it was just, again, what other things that do you have to have solutions for based on? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, players? of course. And then, yeah. Okay, so, you know, we really work on stunting and to help our fives. And um, teams have gotten good at trying to cut our stunts. So we've, you know, also had to get good at adjusting our stunts. We emphasize airtime on our stunts and, and being aggressive. And by airtime, what I mean is once the pass arrives, you know, we're pushing away or doing something to distract or disrupt more than we're on the ball. And so getting that timing down is critical for us. Um, and then the zone, you know, we we do use zone. Uh, we spent a, a full year playing zone, which was a great experience for me as a coach. Um, not, not an experience you can get any other way, I don't think. So by playing a full year of zone, we learned a lot about the things we need to emphasize in our zone, uh, the thing, the ways we need to adjust our zone. Um, and then we also made the zone that we use every year, one that's adaptable into a jump defense. And I think that's uh, really something um, that coaches should think about because having a jump defense, that your team has confidence in playing and knowledge of how to play uh, may, may earn you a matchup advantage somewhere that's really important. It did that for us against Kansas State. We won an NCAA tournament game because we were able to be effective man-to-man, -man, effective in zone, and then effective also in jump. Yeah, and it strikes me, too, that uh, obviously you're a good team to study for so many teams, high school and college, that have some traditional bigs and play traditionally bigger because that can still be effective based on, uh, you know, the modern era, can it? Yeah, yeah, you know, um, I believe it can. You know, there's obviously disadvantages to playing that way now because so many people are comfortable playing smaller. Um, and I certainly wasn't rooting for France in the uh, gold medal game, but watching them do to Team USA what they were able to do, you know, in both those matchups uh, was a lot like watching some of our teams because we do play with size and with power and um, are unusual and disruptive because of it. Right. And they showed that, you know, you, you got to keep going to what your strength is and not – trying to adapt and necessarily go small, as you said. Uh, and that's the same thing you do. You trying to continue attack at a bigs and you'll attack matchups, obviously more at the rim in the scoring area than you will on the perimeter. That's your plan too, right? Well, not so much. Okay. Um, you know, Nelly's big thing was you always, when you get switches, you always attack with your small on their big. Mm -hmm. And so um, we start there typically. And, and what I, what I really emphasize to our big guys and, and I think this is more possible in college than in the NBA or, or Europe. We, we want to rebound with those bigs. So when you get a small guy on you, roll them down to the rim and just kick ass on the offensive glass. That's typically what we ask them to do. Uh, but then also we can do what France was doing. And they rolled down there and just, just played big boy ball right at the rim. And, um, you know, if Gobert makes his free throws in that gold medal game, it might go the other way. Um, you know, but usually it's the offensive rebounds that, that kill teams with switching. 
Um, but, you know, you can often find switch mistakes in teams that switch, you know, like uh, Team USA switched those inbound out of, inline out of bounds plays against France in game one and, and gave up easy, really easy baskets as a result of those switches. And, and, and I think that as time goes on into the season, we often get good at recognizing where switches are most vulnerable too. Well, and we, we talked about our shared love privately about of not switching on and down for those reasons. And, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm different than you because I like switching off the ball otherwise, but I never switch on inbound because just too many gray areas and, uh, yeah. you know, don't want to give you up. Can, yeah, you, those I mean, it's easy to roll the smallest guy right to the basket. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and, and then force the center to get all the way out to a three point shooter. If, if, if a team is known to switch on in, in line out of bounds, um, you know, one of the things, I think we've been exceptional with inline out of bounds defense, with sideline out of bounds defense, and with uh, free throw defense. And when I say free throw defense, I mean free throw blockouts and those things. Um, I give my staff a lot of credit and my players credit for buying into those areas. Those areas we think uh, separate us. Well, and it makes sense, obviously, with your size, too, that you should be a little bit better in those areas if you do it right because of the size on the floor that takes away a lot of space which helps yeah. those special situations as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just as I think um, maybe the team USA was exposed a little bit um, with their inline out of bounds defense in the game, they lost to France. I think that's typical in the NBA because there's so few inline out of bounds plays and the converse is true in college basketball. There's so few sideline out of bounds plays that many coaches and teams aren't well prepared for those situations. Um, we really work hard on our sideline out of bounds offense and trying to gain an advantage with our sideline out of bounds defense. Um, I think those advantages can be found for high school and college coaches if they, if they search for. Them. So you've talked about Don Nelson and uh, let's get into some of those quotes from Don that uh, you can help highlight for coaches and uh, Don Nelson winning his coach in NBA history hall of famer, obviously very innovative and very funny and creative with his quotes as well. So let's start with a shot created must be taken. Okay. Yeah, that was, uh, I remember he said that the first day of training camp is first season. And uh, basically what it means is you can't turn down a shot that's created. I'm not going to play you if you do that. Um, and he did that for a number of reasons. I think, I think he wanted to give guys confidence and he wanted to show them that they better have the skill to make play, you know, shots or plays that were created for them. Uh, we had Matt Barnes on that team. It was a training camp invite who had played for a Hall of Fame coach and Larry Brown who wouldn't let him shoot. And Nelly changed that guy's life by saying a shot created must be taken. And so Matt had the opportunity that, to prove that he was a good enough shooter to make those plays, to have the courage and um, ability to knock those shots down. And it, it changed who he was. Um, and so now, you know, we use the same thing. I don't want bad shooters taking – shots just because they're open any more than any other coach does. Uh, but finding that balance between uh, decision-making and giving guys confidence is where Nelly's genius was somehow. Well, more of us should, that should be our genius because we think about youth development in particular and think about how many players don't develop and don't enjoy the game because they don't get opportunities to play offense. So I love that connection there. Yeah, the players' yeah. confidence, right? And it is a balance. I mean, we can be the smartest in the room and say that player shouldn't sh ever shoot, but how much fun is that to play basketball? <laughs> yeah, well, right. And and uh, there was there was never a funner coach than Nelly. You know, one of the other quotes I, I think I gave you is, uh, "When you lose, act like you won." Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, he, you know, he. That's not a normal response for anybody um, in college and high school basketball, I don't think. I was watching Ted Lasso the other night, though, and, th and that's what he did the first time. They had a big party after they lost, and I thought of Nelly. Uh, there's, there's some magic in there if you can uh, have the confidence to pull it off. Well, the other thing I like to connect to that is, like, shooting with young kids in particular when I do the youth development camps and stuff to say, act like every shot went in because – you know, yeah. you're going to mess. So why not just act like every shot went in? So I love that. You know, that's the, yeah. That's the only coaching I do on free throws. Makes like, sense. I, I, I tell my guys, you know, I don't want to see some sort of negative display when you miss, when you miss act like you made it because, you know, usually guys who make the free throws are the first one sprinting down the other end, you know, generating energy. That's uh, 
Yeah, that's that's straight from Nelly. No, it's both of them. I love that. Act like you want and act like you made the shot. Both those positive psychology approaches obviously help change your mindset. Uh, another one I love, which uh, we can both agree on, is if you, if you can get something better than the play, screw the play. Now, talk, <laughs> yeah, like, like, yeah. screw the play. Like if you break off the play, get something better. Well, there's there's no um, there's no more favorite quote for players than that. You know, every, every player loves hearing that. And so you got to find the balance of uh, informing guys when they don't actually get something better than the play. But um, generating an aggressive mindset, especially for young players now, is, is, is more difficult than it was maybe 15 years ago. I think, uh, you know, so many of the guys we get, and, and, and this is a function of our university and our recruiting, I guess, but uh, so many of them want so badly to please the coach uh, that they don't play aggressively enough in general. So I like saying that quote. I like, uh, you know, trying to use that quote to build confidence and aggressiveness in my player's mindset. Yeah, it's great. And one last one I want to get to is that no speech is longer than the shot clock. Just again, brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, you know, we play a lot of, play a lot of games in the NBA and, uh, you know, Nelly, Nelly has won more NBA games than anybody, and probably that means he's also coached more games than anybody. Um, it was brilliant to – I mean, his, his post-game speech was never more than the shot clock, and uh, there's genius in that, and, and not many of us can do it. Um, I try to remind myself of that all the time when I'm talking to my team because I know that the attention spans, especially emotional moments, are short. Uh, I'm – Jumping around a little bit, I mean, I know you've had some great influences, but the one that you shared with me, which I love, I think was Joe Gather. On offensive rebounds, you have to yeah. back up to score. Can you explain that? Because you talked about aggressive mindsets. You talked about rebounding. This is great. Yes, yeah, so my AAU coach in Roanoke, Virginia, for Roanoke Hawks, was a guy named Joe Gaither. And uh, Joe's still living in Roanoke, still coaching. And I've had great coaches at every level. He was one of them. Um, I was – you know, at, at some point about six, seven and maybe 180 and uh, maybe not even that much. And we didn't have a three point line back then either, I don't think. And so, you know, when I had a knack for finding offensive rebounds, but usually when I would get them because the guys on my team were bigger and more athletic than I was, I was going to give it to somebody else. And he had a rule. He, he instituted a rule in large part because of me. I think he just thought I was so soft. He couldn't stand it. And so he, he said that we had to, if I ever, any of us, if we ever got an offensive rebound, we had to take it back up. And so what I found out real quickly is if I ever got one and there were five defenders who were all trying to beat that, beat that leather off my forehead. Um, so I wasn't very good at it at first, but I got pretty good at extra pivots and shot fakes and deeks and using both hands. And uh, I thought it was the dumbest rule I'd ever heard when he told it to me because I was that kid who questions the coach. Uh, but I look back now and say, man, that thing, that that made me better. That made me a lot better. And uh, it's the type of buy-in that you get from guys who, all, you know, for, for things like that, that often determine how successful a coach can be. Yeah, that's such a cool thing. And I love that that mindset of developing that for your players as well, especially when we're talking about your development. And that that's the key part of that. That helps you change a mindset uh, into uh, something really positive. So, uh, Mike Montgomery is is famous for running billions of sets in all of our minds. Is that true, Coach? Yeah, he had a lot of them. And, yeah. and it was fascinating for me to go to Stanford and see what made that program as great as it was. Um, when I joined in, it was, you know, it, they made it sound like it would be impossible to learn all the plays and all the counters. And it was hard and it was a great challenge. It was, it was really good for me as a coach to go there. Mike would, would uh, in a timeout, would he'd get out a yellow pad. He didn't have like a, a whiteboard. He had a yellow pad and he would write three plays on his yellow pad. And the kids at Stanford would go on the court and have to remember that sequence. And I couldn't believe it because I, I was the kid who couldn't barely go out onto the court and remember the first one. But all these kids at Stanford could remember three. Um, so that was stunning to me to see that, um, to see how they all learned it. And, and it seemed like that would be really hard to learn to me, but they all did there. Um, but I did think there were from time to time players who were weaker with that skill. And so their development got de delayed maybe in that program. 
Um, and the other example like that I use, you know, Dave Odom at Wake Forest um, was a really forceful and demanding coach, coach and he loved getting guys up at 6 a.m. But when we had Tim Duncan, he didn't get us up at 6 a.m. that much. And if Tim Duncan had, had to do 6 a.m. practices every day like they did at Temple, I'm sure he would have still become Tim Duncan, but it might have taken him longer. And so I learned from that, especially with a team full of big guys like I got. Uh, a lot of young big guys who were growing or developing or whatever. Uh, you better not try to overdo that um, too early in the morning or, or too strong with all your practices. you got to be adaptable in order for, you know, young guys to develop at different space, at different paces and, and um, with different skills. Tremendous lessons all the way across the board, Coach. Okay. Coach, I mean, it's in your DNA a little bit, having been with Dave Odom and uh, seeing how effective big players can be in college. And I'm so grateful for you to be able to highlight kind of how you do that in the process that's, that has led to really incredible success at UC Irvine. And uh, we didn't mention this one, but I know, you know, for a fact that you're limited with scholarships as well for out of state at uh, UC school like this as well. And uh, you've got all these different limitations, so to speak, and uh, you've done nothing but find advantages. It's pretty cool. Yeah, you know, um, I look at, at that thing, you know, so we're, we're University of California system. And, uh, you know, so we have a certain number of scholarship players that have to be from California here, uh, more than half. Um, and in many ways, when I started, I looked at that as a disadvantage, but now I see it as something that uh, connects us to our mission and, and focuses our recruiting. Um, and, and that's been a huge part of strategically us figuring it out. We're going to be you know, a, a, a team that has a lot of California players. We also really recruit internationally. Um, I've got a bunch of kids on my roster now who, who come from all different countries. And then the other thing that uh, maybe has been the most successful thing for us is we've recruited the sons of NBA players. And uh, my best player now, uh, my top guy returning is Colin Belt, whose dad Christian played. And, uh, you know, um, what, I, what I've seen there is that often um, – kids like Colin develop later, just as their dads must have, just like Steph Curry did, just like Tim Duncan did. I had the opportunity to coach Dan Grunfeld at, uh, at Stanford, whose dad, you know, Ernie was a great player. And Dan was undervalued as, um, as a recruit. So we've, we've created some advantages there. And, and that's been good. Um, that's credit to those kids mostly. Um, but I do like recruiting the big guys. I like, uh, I like having, uh, you know, when I got, when I got this job, I was the biggest guy on the team and, uh, that's no longer the case anymore. We've always got a crowded team bus. Uh, that's great stuff, coach. Tremendous success. I know a number of coaches will uh, do a deep dive on what you guys have done and how you've been successful. So thanks for sharing the game with us. Okay. Thank you, Chris. I really appreciate you having me.